the whole point of Cop Out is to tell this story. And it's really about when you go there, you do, it's very easy to get swept up in the narrative of the cop, of the sort of headlines and the, there's a lot of jubilation and there's a lot of promise. And you see these guys, they look you in the eyes and tell you this time it's going to be different. We're going to really make some big progress. And then you go around the corner and you walk into the Cryosphere Pavilion and you realize, oh my God, this is all bullshit really because we're not addressing any of this. Welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'm your host. And today we have Nick Breeze as we discuss Cop Out, his new book, and his enthusiasm for wine overflows. And we'll be discussing the future of the wine industry as well. Nick Breeze is a writer, a journalist, and he writes on climate issues, on wine issues, and everything that is important to us today. Speaking for myself, that certainly includes wine. He's also author of the new book, Cop Out, which will be coming to print in March of this year, 2024. We'll leave links in the description to show you how to find his book. Nick, I'm really, really excited to hear uh, your experience at the various COPs. We here at the Climate Emergency Forum have been to quite a few, but I think that you've overtaken us and been to much more. So you have so much to share and especially interested to hear what life is like for a climate journalist and, of course, the future of wine. So, Nick, please share with us your insights. We're really excited to have you here. Thank you very much, Regina. And it's uh, lovely to be here. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak as well. I'll start with Cop Out, the book, which is the title is Cop Out, How Governments Have Failed the People on Climate. And it covers my reporting from uh, COP21 in Paris, where I was there with Paul, actually, and also every COP all the way to the recent one in the UAE. The idea for the book first really started in Paris at the bar at the uh, place we were staying, which was called uh, The Place to Be. And it was called The Place to Be because it was a bit of a hub for famous people to come and give climate talks. And it, it was close to the COP and all that kind of stuff. And Paul and I were having a few beers and we had had a couple of crazy, crazy weeks with all kinds of people. And I, after a while, we came up with the idea of a, a satire on the whole experience called Climate Nutters. And thankfully, I, I didn't write that book but a few years later uh, after COP26 Glasgow I was about to interview Tom Rosenstale who's an author a journalist academic and also an author of novels and he asked me what it was like at COP26 and I gave him a view that was really striking to me that stretched across all the COPs I'd been to between Paris and COP26 and in Paris we really were presented with this case that the politicians were going to save us, that this Paris Agreement was going to be the one thing that was going to do it. They, all these guys, they lined up, and it was largely guys that, you know, more than anything, and they had the solution. They were going to sign this thing, and that was it. And then, sure enough, a year later in Marrakesh, actually during the COP, Trump gets elected and says straight away, I'm going to leave the Paris Agreement. So that was like a traumatic experience for everyone who was at the COP, who has been in this sort of space for so long. And we go then to Bonn, and I didn't really want to go to Bonn, but it was Hugh Hunt who said, you should come, let's take some students. We, we went to Bonn, and sure enough, we there we experienced the rise of youth. They were everywhere, and I was really pleased that I did go in the end. The politics was a disheveled mess, but the rise of youth was very inspiring. The next year was in Poland, which was, again, it was a bit of a sham because the Poles were burning coal like nobody's business and making it very clear they continued to do so. But that's where Greta Thunberg appears and you know, does her thing with in front of the UN. She does something with Stuart Scott. And it's kind of a, you can see that there's a change occurring here. Something's rising from Bonn 
to Poland and then we go to Madrid and the youths have taken over. The, they are really now occupying the narrative. That then goes to, what is it? Well, we have the pandemic, but it goes to Glasgow. And in Glasgow, what we see is a different mood altogether. The politics is clearly failing and the people outside are angry. The police aren't guarding the barrier, they're defending it. And uh, you, whenever you went in and out of the cop, you had this constant drumbeat, you had this constant mood. The people were unhappy. And there was this idea, and it took me back to COP21, and Paul was there as well. We were in the room, and James Hansen and Naomi Klein did an evening downstairs. And Naomi said something that was very interesting, because Canada had been very prominent at COP21 because the Trudeau administration had just come in, the Harper administration had gone out, and there was this sense of optimism. There was a sense of, and well, in fact, their, their slogan was, Canada is back. And there was this idea that things were going to change, things were going to be better. And Klein warned everyone that we shouldn't outsource the power. We shouldn't outsource our agency. Just because we've got this sense of optimism, we have to keep up the pressure. And what we saw in Paris was, I think all of us to a certain degree outsourced our agency. And as we go through the COPs, the next one was a farce because everything that was agreed at COP21 suddenly looked shaking. And between COP22 and COP23, I interviewed Christiana Figueres in London for Mission 2020, which was this thing which was aimed at business because the politics was falling to pieces. The attention was shifting to business. And now business was going to take us over the line and achieve the Paris Agreement. But now, as we can see in 2024, none of this has really happened. The COP itself has been hijacked. The COP process is now being run by the fossil fuel industry. And every single, although we have uh, Sultan al Jaber as a sort of archetypal bad guy, CEO of the oil company, we have to remember that Canada and US ac account for nearly all, over half of the, you know, oil production, our oil expansion, etc. UK is signing more deals. Norwegians are absolutely terrible. The Saudis, the Australians, you name it. We're all in there basically ignoring the science and making everything much, much worse for ourselves. The whole point of Cop Out is to tell this story and it's really about when you go there, you do, it's very easy to get swept up in the narrative of the cop, of the sort of headlines and the, there's a lot of jubilation and there's a lot of promise. And you see these guys, they look you in the eyes and tell you this time it's going to be different. We're going to really make some big progress. And then you go around the corner and you walk into the Cryosphere Pavilion and you realize, oh my God, this is all bullshit really, because we're not addressing any of this. These problems are so big, they're being completely ignored. And the fanfare and the carnival atmosphere in here is complete nonsense. And Cop Out is really about that negative space between. And how do you operate in that space where you have the truth and you have the, the, the bullshit, the mainstream narrative which is trying to tell you, don't worry, we've got it covered, we've got it covered, we're just going to pump some more oil and that will help us transition or whatever the current language is of the time. And deep down, we know it's, it's all rubbish, it's all lies. We're building infrastructure that is going to take us way past two degrees, past three degrees, melt all the ice, cause absolute catastrophe. And we're living in a fantasy where we think that somehow we're going to adapt to it. And it's just simply not the case so cop out sort of takes you through that and it's it's an extension of my overall interview series in a way because it brings together a lot of the voices that i've been talking to for much longer so since about 2010 it brings us to this point i think the the really most recent cop was my red line in a way i i don't want to go to cop 29 i think it's going to be in a complete contradiction in terms in in as much as it's a, the birthplace of oil in a place where they're almost telling us now that they want to expand gas production. Every other nation is doing exactly the same thing. So I don't understand what the point in 
going there really is. And there's, there's obviously a lot of good things that do happen at COP in different spaces, but I think we have to find other forums for those good things. So that's that's the sort of quick guide to COP out. You asked about wine as well, and I've been working with wine for longer than I've been working in climate. The wine world noticed climate change in the 80s because the harvest started shifting earlier. And they didn't know why it was happening, but they just noticed it was happening. It wasn't really properly mentioned until around, I started talking about it in around 2011, 2012, but in around 2014, 2015, a big shift happened. And I I suppose it became obvious and it became much more of a mainstream topic even COP21 happening in Paris, France is a major wine producing nation, experiencing a lot of impacts. You know, this year, we're starting to realize in the wine industry, especially because grapes and wine production is so sensitive to climate, because vintage variation is such a big thing and affects price and everything else, especially in the the higher end wines. You're seeing in Southern Europe, places that have been producing wine for 1000s of years, the Wine production is now having to endure, the fruit is having to endure sort of 40 degree temperatures. That's not something that they've really had to do (laughs) previously. And I've been working as a sort of uh, UK ambassador for the Alentejo region in southern Portugal and went down and visited these wineries and spoke to the manager of the programme. He described last summer as a complete nightmare in terms of long droughts, flooding, you know, the complete, what everything that you hear about in the news we've, we've been seeing there. And the big solution really has been a shift towards regenerative and sharing knowledge. And sharing knowledge is this sort of new dynamic where competitors become collaborators, where new organizations are asking people to send in information. And they're really starting to create a sort of coalition that's stretching from Canada to California to France to Hungary, you know, you, all these countries are now melding together to share knowledge, to overcome a whole wide range of challenges. So I'll leave it there because you know, we're running out of time and I'd be good to hear from other people. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear. Uh, I know that entire regions, entire countries really depend very heavily on wine as part of their culture, but also uh, financially, economically, as an export as well. When the grapes dry on the vine, it makes exporting any type of product impossible. I've I've also heard that it can affect not just the taste, but also the alcohol content of wine. And I'm not sure um, what type of effect that would have on trying to sell the product. Do you have any ideas on that that you can share with us, Nick? Yeah, so years ago, wine, red wines were sort of 12, 13, maybe not really 13%, but you would certainly get sort of 10, 11, 12% alcohol. And today we're getting up to 15, 16% alcohol for a bottle of wine. And that's a a very different proposition. If you're drinking wine with a meal and there might be a couple of you or two or three of you, and you might have a long night planned and you want to drink two bottles you probably have to think twice about doing that if the wine's 15, 16%, because you're going to struggle the next day. (laughs) If, if the wines are more like 10, 11% and you can, I mean, Northern hemis Northern reaches, obviously you get lower alcohol wines because there's not so much sunlight turning the sugars into alcohol, et cetera. The alcohol is a, is a big problem. It can be worked with. It can be managed quite often. The higher alcohols, if you're a real wine taster and you don't don't necessarily want to drink the whole bottle, you just want to taste the wine, then you can still get very balanced wine where you don't notice the alcohol. But that's a kind of, that's a different thing. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that, Nick. I mean, for some people that may be uh, more bang for the buck, but as you say, for those who are drinking because they enjoy wine, they want to have a nice evening, it definitely, uh, it changes everything completely. Paul, uh, I'd like to hear, I know that you and Nick have shared conversations in the past. I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on some of maybe what Nick just shared or on the topic in general. Thank you. So the first COP that I went to was the uh, Lima COP, COP20 in 2014. And uh, what prompted me to go was uh, an email out of the blue from Stuart Scott, who wanted me to, he wanted somebody to occupy his polar bear suit at the uh, 
Lima conference. So he talked me into it and uh, said, hey, I've got air miles for your airfare. Just come to this climate conference. So so that started me off. Um, since then, I've been to five COPs. I missed uh, this uh, last one. I don't know if I can miss another one. There's a lot of networking. There's a lot of you know new contacts. You can kind of meet people from all different countries working on all different things. It's not a sciencey conference, although there is some pavilions like uh, the Arctic, uh, uh, the cryosphere pavilion, for example, where you can get all the science that you want on on the Arctic region. And there are other, you know, most other topics uh, with some science uh, aspects. So those are the, you know, the pros. And of course, the cons we all hear about. Nick's mentioned a few, you know, captured by fossil fuel companies and so on. But, you know, and I think the format, you know, what Nick didn't mention is, uh, the, you know, the numbers of people attending has gone way, way up and it's become very sort of unwieldy. So I think the UN will have to do something, although probably that will take the bureaucracy a while. You know, maybe two cops in a row in fossil fuel producing nations will, uh, you know, wake them up to say, OK, well, let's do something else. Maybe, you know, maybe hold a UN headquarters and alternate between New York and uh, Bonn, two of the main UN headquarters, I think, you know, as climate change proceeds, I think it's becoming pretty clear that we need to, um, we need more cooperation at the global scale. I mean, we actually need a more powerful UN. I think we need more, uh, the idea of world government, uh, you know, world governance rather, because, you know, countries are very much in it for themselves, a lot of the, in, in a lot of ways. And, to solve a global issue like like climate or you know nuclear weapon proliferation things like that we need more cooperation at the highest level so there's interesting talk of strengthening those sort of things while, while we still can because as climate change proceeds the turmoil is actually going to make it more difficult to, to negotiate so you know the cops are important uh, but they've just become you know sort of unwieldy and they, they I think they need to be changed. So yeah, I remember the Paris COP, you know, Nick and I shared a room for a week and we tossed a lot of ideas. He told me about his climate nutters. And I think he, he commented that he'd have a separate chapter for, you know, maybe Stuart Scott, and maybe, uh, you know, a chapter on me and some other people. So, you know, we're all a bit, climate change is driving us all a little bit nutty at times. That's, that's for sure. I think that's a psychological defensive mechanism to uh, absorb all this uh, negative, gloomy information as the climate that continues to deteriorate. So the wine, I'm very interested. We're losing a lot of traditional wine growing regions, especially in Southern Europe, but we are getting new wine growing regions in Northern Europe, and actually some even spreading into Southern UK. You know, in Canada, you know, the wine regions are shifting. We're getting uh, new products like ice wines and things like that in some regions. So. And the other thing is, is does does it affect other uh, alcoholic drinks? Like, does it affect like the rum and vodkas and beers and things like that, or is it like, do, or, or are you specialized just to comment on wine, Nick, or can you make a comment about some other hard liquors and and so on? I am specialized in wine, but I do judge the drinks business sustainability awards, so I, I do read some of the what other drinks are doing and. There are, there are challenges for the sake, which is the ice wine. It's obviously produced from rice. So there are moves and looking into regenerative rice production, which lowers the emissions from of methane quite significantly. There are challenges across the board, but I'm, I mean, my main focus is wine. So I, I, I yeah. can't really go into any detail on this, but you're right in a way that you know, Britain or the UK has had a, a, what they describe as a miracle vintage last year uh, in terms of bumper sized, perfect fruits for still wines, as well as sparkling wines. Sparkling wines are, are better at a cooler climate, but the temperatures are going up quite speedily. So the um, they're able to ripen the red grapes. So there's a sort of, I think it was Kevin Anderson who said something along the lines, it's just typical that the British will be tasting their fine wine while the people in the in the south will be suffering the impacts of climate change caused caused by the global north so you can see right. the you can see there's a sort of um there's, there's another dark humor to the, to the whole thing yes and you know i think you know we talk about the the change of alcohol content in wines and also the change of taste i think we're seeing 
that in a lot of different foods, actually. You know, the coffee industry is one example where, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to grow coffee, decent co to, to get the coffee beans in places. Also, you know, with higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, some of the uh, plants are, are growing faster, but there, there's less flavors in the seeds, which we extract and use, you know, whereas in the vines and of the plant, they're taking up a lot of the, the mass of the plant. So things are, are completely uh, shifting, you know, in all different foods and nutrient quant content is supposedly going down. So, I mean, have you noticed that what, what's the best year in what's your favorite year and favorite wine? I have to ask you that question. Favorite year and favorite wine. It depends what region really, but, um, I would say uh, the the two thousand and the tens from Bordeaux were particularly attractive. I think generally speaking, from doing a lot of tasting now, it's the cooler vintages that produce the most elegant wines. And it's the hotter vintages that produce the fatter, more jammy wines. What you're looking for in fine wine is really this sort, it is a, a sort of elegance. It doesn't cloy in the mouth. It's a balance between fruit, but there will be, you know, a, a sort of freshness to the wine, which allows it to, to be enjoyed in a sort of structured way. So you have structure to the wine through the tannic, but not overpowering tannin. You want those tannins to be almost have a sense of juiciness to them in a way, but provide um, the, the required structure. So the cooler vintages do tend to provide more elegant and wines that will last longer because they're more balanced. Mm. That's important. If they have really hot vintages, you kind of want to drink them earlier on because okay. as they get older, the, those fatter things become more accentu accentuated. So, so you wouldn't recommend the bottles from the Titanic, for example? Well, that would be interesting because they've been well stored. <laughs> <laughs> yes i think they're mostly vinegar now probably <laughs> thanks so much paul yeah thank you for bringing up coffee here we have two of the world's delights wine and coffee being threatened by climate change that's an impending disaster peter do you like coffee in the morning and wine with your dinner yes i um i have one coffee a day and like um everybody does all around the world that sort of gets me going for a while. Yeah, I uh, tend to have, not every night, but I'll have a glass of wine most nights or, and occasionally um, uh, I'll have a beer. So I, I'm living here in Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. And I, I mean, it's absolutely astounding when you go through what we call liquor store here, you know, the, the bottles go on forever, right? And uh, all, all over the planet. And it's, it's absolutely astounding. But what I wanted to say was I'm absolutely delighted um, that Nick Breeze is, is writing this uh, book. It's very going to be a very, very important book. We need more books on, on climate, explaining the climate, explaining the situation, but really now particularly explaining where we're getting with so-called solutions, because obviously we're getting nowhere. So it's just astounding to consider that, uh, you know, we've had uh, 28 of these uh, United Nations major climate change conferences, and things are just getting worse and worse and worse, right? Emissions have never been as high, and that's emission, that's all the emissions, not just CO2, methane and nitrous oxide. They've never been as high as they are now, and they have been for the past couple of years. I'm sure that Nick will be able to um, to reveal and explain uh, many, many reasons why the cops are not functioning as clearly they were intended to function with the 1992 um, Climate Change uh, Convention, which I've always thought was actually a very, very good convention. And um, uh, my impression is that the cops are being progressively actually weakening the effect of the uh, climate change convention. I would also encourage people to um, uh, tune in and 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 listen and watch um, Nick's interviews. Uh, Nick has developed a um, uh, really an almost perfect um, interview style. I mean, he really, really, really is good at it, and um, he's very, very personable. So um, uh, it's easy for 
people of of, of all kinds and you know all disciplines and uh, levels to um uh, to really get a good interview with Nick. And I really want to congratulate my friend Nick here because um you know we have United Nations ambassadors, but um uh, apart from Arnold Schwarzenegger again. Um, I don't think we have a better ambassador in the world than Nick. So we have two great amb ambassadors, Arnie Schwarzenegger and, and Nick Breeze, right? So we really should be able to make some progress um, uh, with, with, with people like that, shouldn't we? On the issue of the conferences, uh, you know, for decades, when the big governments and the big corporations have got together and had their big conferences, there's always been an alternative people's conference that's sort of not happening um I, I think with the cops because you know you have a large number of, of people going and um you know protesting and black eyes and trying to make the point and publicizing you know that we have to get off fossil fuels and we have to get off fossil fuels like today like yesterday and that's very good but i i'm i think the cops are so big that they've sort of swallowed all that up almost. And the what I'd call the corporate style management of the cops is really something to behold in 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 the worst kind of way. Um, and really we saw a, um, we saw the most extreme example of this with the um uh, with the Jaber um uh, cop in in the United Arab Emirates. Um, it was quite quite extraordinary the things that were happening. So that's uh, I, I think that's really 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 all I, all I can say. Except that with regards to the, uh, generally uh, the interviews and and journalists, um, uh, everybody's doing really I would think a pretty good job. You know, the truth of course is getting more and more difficult to tell. Um, you know, I've been sort of jokingly saying to myself over the years, I'm doing my best to tell the terrible truth, but the, the truth is now uh, beyond terrible. It, it, it's awful. So the challenge and the necessity to actually communicate those truths, of course, is 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 more important, more important than ever. I think Nick mentioned a narrative. We really have to keep our own narrative. We really have to own our own narrative, right? our own values, our own principles, our own dreams, and our own ambitions for ourselves, and particularly, of course, for our children and future generations. We really have to hold and own those. We can't allow the corporate world, which is just supported by the governments now. I mean, it's, it's, one, um, uh, it's one sort of evil enterprise, as far as I'm concerned now. So, um, Nick, it's a great time for doing that, so thanks very much, Nick, and it's an absolute pleasure to um, uh, be with you and chat with you a little bit again. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, just a, a bit of comment on, on the narrative. It's, so, it's such an important point, and I think that we talk a lot, and we hear this a lot, people talking about hope. And I think this has come out in some of the interviews I, I've given recently, as people say, I think we need courage more than hope. And we need the courage to stand up for the values and ideals that we that we have and the future that we want and not be dictated to for accepting this sort of it's not even second or third rate it's it's the absolute pits it's it's really um a narrative of hell basically so i think it, we need courage to stand up to stand up much more and speak out about what we believe in, what we want, what we, the future we want and the action, the structural changes that we want. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing up those points, Peter. One of the things that I, I was curious about, Nick, is what made you write this book? What was your process? And um, what do you hope people get out of reading it? The idea for a book actually did, I was being honest, it did come from the, the beers and the conversation with Paul in Paris, but it was kicked down the line a lot until uh, that conversation with Tom Rosenstiel. And he said at the end of our conversation, he said, someone should write up what you've just been talking about in a gonzo style. And I thought, oh, you know, that's really interesting. And about a week later, I got a message from a friend of mine who asked me what it was like. And he wrote back saying, that would make a really good gonzo story. And I thought, well, two people saying it in one go, 
and then I so the conditions were I had the time and I wrote the first draft and sent it to someone and they introduced me to an agent and so on and so forth and it's, I mean it's been kicked around a hell of a lot since then it's a it's a very more focused text than it was then but and the editing process has allowed me to go beyond Glasgow to include Egypt and the UAE which I'm very pleased about because that is an important part of this story and Peter was just talking about the, the corporate style of the cops and uh, Paul mentioned the fact that they're all really big now they're all mega cops every single cop is a mega cop as they go to more authoritarian nations our, what we can do at the mega cop is restricted you can't protest you can't have so many civil society meetings outside they're just not tolerated and if you protest you're probably going to get arrested and you, you know these these are all things that are coming out of these new iterations of the COP. And I think we need to start as individuals, where we talk about our own values, our own narratives and all the rest of it. We, we need to take the good parts of the COP and say, right, we need another place to do this. We need to explore all the things, whether it's loss and damage, whether it's equity, whether it's technological solutions, whether it's natural solutions, whatever we want to talk about, we need to find a much better forum where we can where we can tackle them we can't really keep trekking off to places which are just massive contradictions sorry but I, I drifted off why I wrote the book but it, but that but allowing that to come into it has been very important I think thank you so much Paul I see that you wanted to say something just wondering Nick uh, how much focus you have in your book on young people the youth they understand a lot more of global problems not just climate change then we give them credit for, you know, they get all kinds of information on social media. They see people being maimed in wars, for example. And, you know, then people wonder why they're out in protests against, <laughs> against wars, right? So, I mean, the youth are the future. Of course, Greta Thunberg was a, a big sort of asteroid who came along and shook up the climate movement and got, you know, world attention, gave incredibly passionate speeches at COPS and also at the, at the World Economic Forum venues and so on. So she's not a young girl anymore. She's a, you know, a, a, a woman. And um, here, we don't hear as much about her, but she's still very active in the climate movement. So, so I mean, are you, uh, do you have a lot in your book about sort of youth and youth movements? And also, you know, a book is another way to get through to youth. I've noticed, you know, one field that's coming up that's actually here already is, you know, that's grown is climate fiction. We're seeing all kinds of climate fiction books come out and, you know, paintings with climate change depicted and so on. So can you maybe comment about how we can better get to young people? I mean, are you yes. doing TikToks, for example? I'm not doing TikTok. In Paris, I didn't pay any attention to the youth. I mean, I, in a way, I was the rookie in Paris. I, I was running around interviewing people. I didn't know what was going on. It was just absolute chaos. In Marrakesh, when everything fell to pieces, Hugh and I, actually Hugh Hunt and I, walked into a younger press conference and ended up speaking to the youth delegates afterwards and invited one of them to Cambridge for the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series and who gave the closing address with scientists and so on on the very final session. And... That was really the first interaction. And then the next year in Bonn, we took the students there. But really in Bonn, the whole student, um, youth scene exploded with the, it sort of fused with the indigenous scene. And it was really, everyone noticed it. And the year after that in Poland, that was the year that sort of, I suppose the most thing to mention is that Greta arrived and it was, it was sort of the coming together of the previous year and then in Madrid, and I, I know you guys were there as well, that really, it was like when the youngsters, the well-known youngsters walked into the room, it was like Michael Jackson or the Beatles had arrived. There were charging um, mainstream media press guys running past us and cop police, you know, they have these sort of sheriff uniforms. They were sort of holding back these guys and the dynamic had changed. And this, this is a major part of the book really. And I was interviewing people from Fridays for Future um, delegates from South America. These are people who were 18, 19, 20 years old. And if you think back to the the uh, Rio Earth Summit in 1992, I mean, I was about 17 then. And I didn't 
comprehend any of these issues. I mean, this was so far off my radar. I was out having a good time, just enjoying life. I was speaking to people of that age in Madrid who were, who live and breathe this stuff. And it, it was absolutely remarkable how much they understood the system, how much they were able to articulate the suffering of people who live thousands of miles away from them and how much they wanted to sacrifice to make sure that they could play a role in trying to end that. And I think that's, um, that's really informs the rest of the book. I think that's, that is a major part of the whole narrative as we come through that, that is, it is largely about empathy. It's largely about trying to, to control the narcissistic parts of all of us, of our, you know, our inner worlds that dictate, oh, I need to have that. I need to have that. I need to have, and we forget the consequences because we think we're making ourselves look better or feel better or whatever the thing is. And the young people seem to have got a much better handle on that than people of my generation. Nick, thank you so much for bringing up the the issue of compassion and empathy, because it is like, I, I truly believe that without these essential ingredients, we are not going to move to do the things that we absolutely must do to, uh, you know, put a cork on this, like continually digging for, for oil, right? So and I think that's very key. So thank you for that. And I know, Peter, that's a very important issue for you as well. So if I'm sort of going to have the last word here, I'd like to reminisce a little bit on uh, what to me was um, uh, a great example of a climate conference success in every way. And that was the conference that followed the abject failure of the 2009 Copenhagen conference. If you think back in 2009, in that year, there was a general realization that we were in a climate catastrophic situation. And from that, there was a general realization and, and belief and expectation that Copenhagen was going to change everything, that this would be the big conference in which um, uh, everybody would agree to do the right thing and would start pulling back from the fossil fuel economy and uh, get emissions into decline. And again, so many young people went there. Uh, so many young people were, uh, were so distressed by the uh, end of the conference, which really was a, um, a sort of flat, it ended in nothing. And um, the uh, then premier of Bolivia, and indigenous um, president of Bolivia, Morales, Evo Morales um, uh, stepped up and he met all the young uh, people. I wasn't there, so um, this is what I got from the media. And um, he sympathized with them and he said, look, I'm going to have a conference next year. I'll do another conference and we'll do it in Bolivia. We'll get you all there as best we can. And we will have a venue in which um, you can really take part and uh, make things happen. Now, the media the, were very sort of um, negative about this. They thought oh, this is a strange idea. You know, maybe he'll get a few thousand people going to um, uh, Bolivia, but he's not going to do anything. I, I went, and, uh, my wife, Julie, went, and we went with some friends in, in Canada. It was an absolutely astounding experience. Um, uh, the whole conference was one of the best experiences of my life. There were 30,000 people there, um, indigenous, of course, with all their wonderful, attractive costumes and everything. Everybody mixed. Everybody worked very, very hard every day. It was a, a truly, um, I mean, it was more than a democratic event. Everybody had their say. Um, everybody discussed um, politely and constructively. And at the end of that conference, there, there was a document that still remains the only true um, democratic uh, document expression agreement internationally, but not an agreement between the governments, an agreement between the peoples of the world, and particularly led, in this case, by the indigenous peoples. And that's still online. It's detailed. It's long. It's called the uh, People's Agreement of Cochabamba. I just wanted to share that because it was such a vivid and such a, a huge difference to these, yeah, these mega climate conference, massive circuses um, uh, that are going on every year. 
So I agree with Nick about the uh, danger uh, of of hope, but that conference to me was uh, certainly remains one example of uh, hope and what human beings really can achieve uh, together with uh, goodwill and and friendship. I mean, it it ran like clockwork. This conference in Cochabamba just ran like clockwork, and it was managed by students, by by um, young students from uh, Bolivia. So it can happen. It can happen. Well, thank you so much for ending on a positive note there, Peter. I think, of course, we understand the danger of hope. It can allow us to, you know, to sit back and think that someone else is going to take care of it. On the other hand, it can be a spur to give us the energy to do what needs to be done. So I think that's really great. And I really appreciate, Nick, you joining us today. I'm especially looking forward for your forthcoming book, Cop Out, and I encourage all of our viewers to pre-order one if you can. It promises to be a great read. So I want to thank you for joining us for another Climate Emergency Forum. If you appreciate the show today and the guests that we are so very fortunate to be able to bring to you, please make sure to like this video because it helps us with the algorithm. Subscribe if you've not and and share this video as well. Get out the word. We want as many people to see the climate emergency form as possible. And we look forward to seeing you next time here at the Climate Emergency Forum.